Good evening and welcome to this edition of De Facto Review. We are live on Facebook at V Television. We're also on Twitter, hashtag De Facto. With us tonight are the independent journalist Terence Edwards and Ashley Whelan, the country director of the International Republican Institute in Mongolia, coming up on the program. As Mongolia marks 100 days under its new government, a report suggests members of parliament are now twice as wealthy. Former Prime Minister Saikhambilik Chaimed defends the sale of Russia's 49% stake in the Erdenet mine back to Mongolia. New analysis suggests Mongolia could wait almost 20 years for dividends on its biggest investment. Families of those arrested after the murder of one of the country's democratic revolutionaries cry foul 18 years on. And tomorrow, Mongolians mark the birth of Chinggis Khan. We'll be discussing why his legacy lives on today. Thank you for joining us. We begin with the wealth of Mongolia's newly elected members of parliament. According to a recent report on Icon.com, the country's new parliamentarians are twice as wealthy as the previous ones. This comes just months after the country's new finance minister declared the country in a state of economic crisis. Terry, as I understand it, this isn't necessarily saying that they're being paid twice as much, right? Well, it just comes down to the fact that Mongolia requires by law for all public officials to submit their, their assets, their mm -hmm. income, make a statement. This was done almost immediately after the election in June. And we're just seeing that we do have parliament members that, ha that come from a higher income bracket. So according to the data, they, the, we had them making a total of 26.9 billion Tugrik, and that's almost double today to 41.6 billion Tugrik. It doesn't, there is, if you look at the report, it does say like where these assets uh, come from, whether it be apartments, uh, automobiles, that sort of thing. So it does uh, give, you know, divide it into it brackets. Mm. But we, we also see, it's worth mentioning that the savings has also increased. Uh, we're now at 78.4 billion co compared right. with 21.2 billion. Mm -hmm. So, you know, basically it's a question that these are just wealthier people perhaps than the previous lot. Yeah, and that's going to happen naturally as Mongolia becomes a more prosperous country. But it is a big jump uh, to almost yeah. double. It's significant. Um, Ashley, in a recent poll by your organization, IRI, which came out this week, if mm -hmm. I am correct, uh, you guys found that corruption and poverty are major concerns among the many Mongolians that you guys surveyed. Mm -hmm. How much does the wealth of their politicians factor into that? Sure. Well, I think it's important to unpack these things. So what IRI did was surveyed 5,000 Mongolians all over the country about their opinions on politics, economics, a range of issues. Mm -hmm. So what we found is that two, uh, sorry, three quarters of respondents are very concerned about corruption, and 70% are concerned about different areas within economics. So perhaps unemployment or price increases, but this is a separate issue from the wealth of parliamentarians. Um, certainly, this is going to be something that citizens are going to be concerned about, but wealth does not equal corruption. What wealth indicates is uh, a range of things. Um, and I think that what's important to note is the importance of laws like what Terry mentioned mm. that have these asset disclosure laws. So citizens have access to understand who represents what businesses, who is uh, receiving financial gains from what types of investments. Right, that's the key. So that they Absolutely. know that their MPs are acting in their interest and independently. Yeah. Well, this week, the new government also marked its first 100 days mm -hmm. in office. Um, from your perspective, what has it achieved thus mm -hmm. far? Sure. Uh, the 100 day uh, marker is always a very important symbolic one. And, and I think within these first 100 days of the cabinet, we've seen them address head on issues of economic growth. They've been very transparent in talking about 
the debt challenges, the uh, economic crisis that Mongolia is facing, and they've been reaching out to partners. Um, you know, there are many reports about the IMF and visits to Japan, and a lot of consultation with partners about how to move forward. And I think that's a, a key uh, achievement. Yeah. And, of course, many challenges still remain, right, Terry? Yeah, just real quick, I want to point out that the actual number of their earnings is less important. It is, it is nice to see what they're earning, and I suppose to someone you know, just getting by these days because of the tough economy. It's troubling to see your politicians, your public officials making so much more than you earn. But I hope what the Mongolian public is really looking at is what these officials actually own. What are their assets? And that'll give you an idea of what their conflicts of interest are. When you look at the mining minister and see he owns mines, that's an example of a conflict of interest. Of course, that wasn't flagged by the independent agency against authority, but that would be, that, that's troubling to me. Meanwhile, Mongolia's economy is not doing great. The Tugaric is still sinking. It, it hit another milestone going above 2,300. To the dollar. To, to the dollar, mm. yeah. Uh, they've cut the deficit a bit, but it's still above 15% of GDP. So there's still a lot of troubles to look forward, and that's why Mongolia is going to go to the table of whether it be the IMF, China, or of various partners. Mm, indeed. Well, moving on, um, this week Parliament also convened to discuss the sale of the 49% stake in the Erdenet mine, one of the world's biggest copper mines, sorry, one of the country's biggest copper mines, which was previously held by Russia but sold back to Mongolia, and it's now held by the Mongolian Copper Corporation. Now, uh, the former Prime Minister, Saikambili Chaimed, was called to this meeting and he defended the sale of the mine. Also present was the CEO of Trade and Development Bank, Mr. Orhan, TDB being the bank that funded and advised on this transaction. So, Terry, can you tell us a little bit more about what was discussed at the recent session and why it's relevant, given I know that you've been following this story pretty closely. So what's frustrating with this case is there's a lot of accusations made, but they're not being very specific about anything. There was, uh, there was said that seven international treaties and conventions were broken, but what are the specifics of that? That's my question as a reporter. You know, what, what, are, the, what are they breaking? For Oil Tolga, another strategic entity, I know that Rio Tinto can't just go and offload its own interest in the mine. Uh, Mongolia, as the partner organization, would have to agree to that. So that might be the case here. I'm speculating. But there hasn't actually been anything specifically said about that. But because it is such an important asset, the former prime minister has been called in. And he, I just want to read a quote from him. He said, during the cabinet meeting, some cabinet members felt the issue should be discussed in the parliament. So he did consider that legislation, the fact that the legislator should have been weighing in on this. But then he said that others decided it didn't need to be. Well, yeah, then he kind of backtracks and said, we were running out of time. Yeah. And so we just went forward. He I, said he was on a tight deadline. I mean... I think this is something that Mongolia is going to have to set a precedent for or mm. perhaps make a law because there has been this back and forth of what is the executive allowed to do? What do they need approval from parliament? And it's not just one project. It's been OT. It's been TT. It's, now it's Aeronet. And this is not a problem that's going to go away. Right. So it's a, it's a problem with the process. And I'd like to bring Ashley in here because... Basically, it seems that the main issue with this was um, transparency or a lack thereof. I mean, this happened under quite strange circumstances by most accounts, you know, An right before timing, the parliamentary sure. elections in June. Mm -hmm. um, I know that you've worked in governance around the world. So based on your experiences, how do you think that countries can build better transparency in making major decisions for their public. Well, I think you've hit on the right point, is that transparency and engagement around these kinds of issues are what, what is most important. And as Terry brings up, the separation of powers and the systemic and 
uh, structural challenges that are born of the a mixed system like Mongolia has are, are quite evident in this case. Um, where there are opportunities are to leverage some of the laws that Mongolia does have, like the law on public hearings, which allows parliament to bring uh, respondents in to answer questions, whether they be from private government, uh, private organizations, other government organ uh, state-owned enterprises, or government bodies. And using this kind of uh, mechanism will allow the public to understand and other government bodies to understand the process. Mm. So they know more about what is going on. Mm -hmm. Well, keeping with the mining theme, um, this week a new report came out into the dividends of the Oyutolgoi copper and gold mine in Mongolia's Gobi Desert. Now, this mine is majority owned by Rio Tinto, but this new report by the Berlin-based consultancy Open Oil suggests that the country, Mongolia, may not receive dividends for up to two decades, if at all. So it's a, it's a pretty um, big statement. Um, and it claims that Mongolia forfeited receiving royalties and revenue from other sources such as taxes sooner because it held on to its 34% stake in this mine. Terry, could you explain a little bit more about how they came to these conclusions? So this is a third party organization, yeah. just looking at the technical report that Turquoise Hill released. Turquoise Hill is, of course, the 66% stakeholder that Rio Tinto owns majoritively. The subsidiary of Rio, yes. yeah. So just looking at that data, they came to the conclusion that it might not come to dividends until 2035. And it, it, it's using this one project as actually a model for other projects around the world to look at that you know, ownership is important, but you're giving up some financial benefit from doing that. Right. So that the definition of value, in other words, because is, am I correct that they they say they forfeited about a billion dollars? I think one point three billion. One point three billion since two thousand and ten, yeah. based on the costs of um, recovering. It would have Rio's been taxes. Investment. It would yeah. have been higher royalties. This sort of thing. And I, I think what Mongolia really has to think about is having you are the this country is the law of the land. They set the regulations and the laws. Mm -hmm. Is it valuable for Mongolia to have board members on, for the company, or is it enough just to be setting the laws? I mean, that is what people have to think about, because at the end of the day, it's always Mongolia's resources. That's why Oyo Toga pays royalties. It's in return for having taking your resource. So it's really important that Mongolia just look at these things, because it's not so cut and dry you know, when it comes to ownership. And at the end of the day, Mongolia is always going to be setting the rules. Mm. Whether or not it's valuable to have those board members in there, that's the question for Mongolian society. It's, it's confusing because on a recent trip, um, the new CEO of Rio Tinto, Jean-Sebastien Jacques, said that uh, Mongolia would receive dividends within 10 years. So it's, it's slightly different. Well, they're gonna have their, it's not surprising. And it's a touchy issue, and yeah. Rio would not want to say such a pessimistic no. uh, projection. Yeah. So I think what it really comes down, I, I really am glad to see third parties weighing in because they have different, they're more disinterested than Rio Tinto here, and more disinterested than the government either, which mm. has repeatedly re politicized this issue. Mm. Ashley. Going back to your poll um, that you recently did, how did Mongolians view these major mining projects in general? There's a lot of skepticism. There's a lot of skepticism over ownership, concern about ownership, and concern that uh, Mongolia receives the benefits that it, it is um, due. Mm. Um, and what we see is there's an overall support for foreign direct investment, 63% in fact, said that they believe that foreign direct investment was a key to reducing the unemployment rate. Um, but at the same time, you see the balance of there being skepticism over ownership, mm. uh, favoritism towards parliament passing laws that make ownership 
more challenging, yeah. and overall uncertainty about how they felt about Oyo mm -hmm. um, which I think all points to the need for greater communication. Um, foreign direct investment and, and mega projects like these are very complicated. Um, and, and the average citizen doesn't have a couple hours to dedicate to learning the, the intricacies. So what they need is they need their elected representatives to interpret things for them, to share information with them so that they feel engaged in the process and more confident in um, the fact that their representatives are making decisions on their behalf that are in their interests. Mm. So again, going back to transparency. Yeah. It all goes back to transparency, <laughs> it always does. And, uh, you know, meanwhile, Rio's subsidiary, Turquoise Hill, also said that um, they're basing these projections on gold and copper prices rebounding significantly. They say that the value of the mine could go up by $1.3 billion. Yeah, so what, what's, we're, we're looking you know, at given copper. all the volatility in recent years with copper prices, is that um, realistic? Well, so they're looking at what's essentially a short-term window, but so they're, they're looking at copper going up to $3 a pound. So that gives uh, about another billion, more than a billion to the value of the project itself. Mm -hmm. But what people have to realize is this is a hundred year project and I, I'm going to sound like a Rio guy here. <laughs> it's, it's, it's 50 to hundred year project. These prices are going to fluctuate all the time. And I know when I talk to Rio officials about this, they're not so interested in what copper is going to cost tomorrow. They have to think about what it's going to cost over the next five decades. Mm. Well, they reportedly had a team of investors in this week to go and survey the mine. Um, and it comes after, um, you know, claims by some analysts recently that actually the mine is not as valuable as it's stated to be. What, what are the arguments from naysayers? Well, there's two points I'm going to pick out of there. Number one, there's country risk. Mongolia has been proven to be sometimes a great partner, sometimes a troublesome partner. And that for foreign investors, they see that, they get scared. And re so it's always going to be on Rio's, the back of Rio's mind. Mm. Uh, more importantly is the fact that it's a, it's a mine with only one nation consuming it. So the whole project is always going to be make or break on China and Chinese growth. Mm. So eventually we do hope well, to see... Well, what China says it's growing up. Exactly. Mm. So we do hope... Yeah that uh, OUT copper and gold will someday go to the ports and perhaps to Seaborn. I mean, it has been a rebound this year. Yeah. Yeah. But at the end of the day, this is a project to feed China's industry. So mm -hmm. it's really, that's what a lot of investors get nervous about. Right. Well, turning now to the killing 18 years ago of the one of the country's uh, democratic revolutionaries, the leader of the Democratic Union, Sanja Soren Zarig. Family members of those who were arrested for his murder um, last year have come forward and said that they've been framed. Um, Terry, again, this is something I know you've been following. Can you give a little bit more insight into what was said at that presser? So there were some statements made uh, we'll start with the, the mother, B. Satam Dabja, and his sibling, Tim Chimge. And they called the press conference to discuss what's been going on, what's news. And that's why we're talking about it today. So they said, uh, two suspects said the Mongolian law enforcement agencies are trying to frame them instead of exposing the truth. So they're saying basically that you're just trying to read, all, redirect all this attention on us rather than actually get to the bottom of who killed Zorik. Right. And this, I mean, in, in the past, um, there was another suspect, um, Enkbat Damran, who was, his, the charges against him were dropped by the Attorney General, but he was then held for another three years for releasing state secrets, and he died five days after his release from jail. So it's, um, it's been a long case over almost two decades now. Um, what does it say about 
um, other cases involving very high profile figures here. So I don't want to make any judge of who's guilty and who's innocent. That's not my place. But what's really important is this is a test of Mongolia's democracy because these are high profile officials involved here. We have uh, someone who is expected to be a, a prime minister murdered and there, I've heard I've heard all the conspiracy theories. There's so many There's different so many. stories. And yeah. a lot of these involve public officials. In fact, the, the former mayor, Battle, is being investigated for this. There, are, there is a statement that his hat was found on the scene of the crime. I'm not going to make any speculations further than there. But the fact that this is actually looking at public officials is encouraging. What's discouraging is Th this is taking so long to resolve. Yeah, it's, um, and I mean, his widow, um, Bolgan, was um, released recently as well, just uh, last month. She was being held for questioning. She was held for, but for 10 months in solitary confinement without a trial. So it's um, clearly still a case that's ongoing and it doesn't seem that there's any uh, near term resolution. I don't see any resolution of this in the near term at all, but I think a lot of Mongolians should be concerned about the fact that people are being held without trial. This is an issue that I think everyone has to worry about because you can always say, it's my neighbor, it's someone else, but everyone should be worried about someone else's liberties because that also reflects on your own. That is true. Well. Finally, something a little more happy to end on. Tomorrow marks, um, well, tomorrow Mongolians will be marking the birth of their founding father, Chinggis Khan. Now, we don't know exactly when Chinggis was born, but this year the day has been slated for October 31st. Um, Chinggis Khan has um, quite a legacy. He was the founder of the Mongol Empire and famously it's stretched to one-fifth of the world's inhabited land. Now, in the West, we know of him as a bloodthirsty warrior, but um, there's much more to him than that. Ashley, could you tell us about what Chinggis did for politics in Mongolia and establishing the country mm -hmm. and system of governance? I think it's an important story to tell. Everyone knows uh, about the hordes, and they know about the conquering, and they know these kinds of things, but there's so much more to the story. Um, recently, I had the opportunity to visit Harhoran, where his government was seated, uh, and was able to see the first ever, or replica of the first ever, diplomatic passport. Wow. And I did, it's just a cool thing that you don't even think about being invented. You know, because it's so commonplace now to have More passports. More than 800 years ago, mm -hmm. yeah. But this allowed people free passage through many lands in order to facilitate trade uh, and development. And I think what, what also struck me was the replica of how the city looked um, and the fact that there was religious tolerance throughout the city. There was a section for different religious groups, and they were all tolerated under his, his uh, reign. Um, and something also very important to the democracy that Mongolians now live in mm -hmm. was the idea of a meritocracy. Yeah. Um, and the idea that if you worked for uh, a goal, you would be rewarded based on skill and based on your ideas and your performance, as opposed to just who you were born, which form family you were born into. Yeah, he was, it's, he was famous for uh, promoting people who weren't even related to him over mm -hmm. his own children if he didn't think that they were up to the task. Mm -hmm. um, according to the Jack Weatherford book, he had four daughters and four sons equally promoted mm -hmm. and he banned the sale of women too. So he did a lot for them in Mongolia as well. Um, far, hundreds of years ahead of Europe and other For Asian sure. countries, yeah. Terry, he, um, as, as Ashley was touching on, um, he did a lot for trade and commerce as well. Can you tell us more about that and how he opened up the Silk Road? Well, it's interesting because as Mongolia has gotten past its socialist history, a lot of people have used the Chinggis Empire as kind of a counter to that this idea of free market capitalism. They took down a statue of Lenin and they put up Marco Polo, who was a, a trade man, he was yeah. a merchant. Yeah. So it's really 
interesting to see if you look at more modern looks at what Genghis Khan or Chinggis Khan achieved during his rule was having safe and free trade without any impediments. Mm. And that, that's, that's an important ideal to aspire to. Yeah, and taking innovations from different places and combining them into new technologies here, like the catapult, for example. Yeah. yeah. Oh, very, um, very interesting man. And all this from a, from a young man who was reportedly born into poverty and lost his father at a young age and raised as an outcast. So pretty remarkable story. And that's all for this edition of De Facto Review. You can follow us on Facebook at V Television. We're also on Twitter at hashtag De Facto. Thank you very much for being with us. From Terence Ashley and myself, Saikinam Rare, and have a wonderful Chinggis Day tomorrow. Thank you.